Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. What do you think about Congress? You know, if you're like many Americans, you probably want to throw the bums out. But most congressmen and senators work hard and honestly. So why are so many voters angry with them? Joining us today to sort through the conflict and the consensus are Norman Ornstein, resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute and co-author of Renewing Congress. Edward Crane, president of the Cato Institute and co-editor of Market Liberalism, a Paradigm for the 21st Century. Thomas Mann, director of governmental studies at the Brookings Institution and co-author of Renewing Congress. And Jonathan Rauch, author of Demosclerosis, the silent killer of American government. The question before this house, what's wrong with Congress? This week on Think Tank. You know, when American officers were captured during the Revolutionary War, they shouted, Long live Congress! Long live Congress? Today, many citizens are shouting at their representatives, and the battle cry sounds like, off with their heads! What happened? Why are these usually dedicated men and women being so assailed? Well, take a look at Congressman Dan Rostenkowski's recent 17-count indictment. It is just the latest in a long line of embarrassments for our national legislature. Others include check bouncing, postal fraud, sexual misconduct, savings and loan scandals, and bribery. Polls show that public respect for Congress has been at an all-time low. Look, Americans rate their representatives' ethical standards even below those of journalists and television talk show hosts and not much ahead of car salesmen and insurance salesmen. Why is the public so angry? Beyond the petty lawbreaking, some say it's arrogance. Even after all the furor, congressmen still get special perks, free mail, free parking at national airport, and subsidized television studios. They exempt themselves from the normal enforcement of virtually every law they pass that governs the typical workplace, including affirmative action, worker safety, and the Americans with Disabilities Act. Other critics of Congress point to the potent influence of wealthy special interest groups. Congress is also the most heavily staffed legislature in the world. The number of congressional employees has gone up sixfold since 1947. Now, defenders of Congress argue that the actual corruption is much lower than it used to be. They say that the smoke-filled back rooms are things of the past. Lawmaking is now more open to public scrutiny and access than ever before. And many of those so-called special interest groups, remember, often speak for the public. Uh, Norman Ornstein, uh, colleague, political scientist, uh, tennis competitor, uh, let us begin with you, sir. Uh, is, um, is the uh, Congress corrupt? Uh, I would put myself on the side of those who would say it is far less corrupt than it has ever been. And also, we have a, a very ambitious study that was just done of 24 countries, uh, the larger mature democracies around looking at laws and standards regulating ethics, which has by far the toughest and tightest and has for years and gets even tighter. The United States, compared to other legislatures, it's much less corrupt. But there's no question, Ben, that the American people are absolutely convinced that it's more corrupt than it has ever but been, you're and not. it's worse than it's ever been. No, and I think you wouldn't right. find a historian who wouldn't tell you that let's, uh, it's, it's cleaner than it's ever let's been. Let's ask Ed Crane, is, is the American Congress corrupt? Well, I, I'm not sure that, that corruption's the main issue anyway, but yes, I mean, if you look at uh, Jim Wright and Tony Coelho and Danny Raskin-Kowski and, uh, and the Keating Five and St. Germain and all that, there's still obviously St. Germain with the savings and loans right. scandal, right? Uh, there's still obviously, obviously a lot of corruption in, in Congress, but I think what, what bothers people more than corruption per se is, uh, is the arrogance of Congress. There's a, there's a tremendous uh, sense that there's a division between the kind of a ruling elite has, has grown up in Congress and that uh, they don't relate to the people, and that's, yeah. that's e evidenced by the, the fact that they don't even subject themselves to their own laws. Jonathan, what do you think of our distinguished Congress? I think, in a sense, it's too clean, which isn't to say that people should be more crooked. But for an institution that's complicated and political to work, you've got to have a certain number of power brokers who can function in back rooms, and we got rid of that, and now we're paying the price for it. 
that, that the Congress over-reformed itself. In a sense, and it became too much power to too many subcommittee chairmen. And these guys are worried about getting indicted for parking in the wrong parking space, when at the same time they can gin up a tax bill and sell off a lot of tax breaks to a lot of interest groups, which they can then go to work for, and that's legal. Tom, Tom Mann, is, is it perhaps also a function of uh, scandal mongering by the press, for, yeah. for one example? The focus on scandal is a distraction. We've got higher laws, tougher standards, more enforcement mechanisms, and norms in the media for investigative journalism, uh, a focus on the fall of great celebrities. And Jonathan's right, it's largely a distraction from the nitty gritty problems, uh, potential conflicts of interest of, of governing itself. The less we hear about scandal and corruption in Congress, the better off we'll be. You know, one of the things uh, that uh, Ed brought up, uh, it's certainly the case that Americans perceive the institution as riddled with arrogance and living by a set of standards that are totally unavailable to the average person. It was a well, long well, survey done. that's true? It's, it's basically not true. Uh, I, I, I can't park at, uh, at National Airport. There's that nice little little lot right next to the terminal that I use, and I got to go out into some satellite terminal. And That is absolutely true, but I, I will tell you, Ben, that uh, the perks that you get as a scholar at a think tank uh, are uh, actually <laughs> greater than those that the average member of Congress has. Well, I've had a member of Congress. Where, where is my swimming pool? <laughs> <laughs> Just tell me, Norman. I, I won't I'm even curious. talk about yeah, our, right, your dining right, room. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. uh, I've had members of Congress who are shopping in a grocery store in the district, which they do as everybody else does, have people come up to them and say, I didn't know you did your own shopping or that you shopped at all. We had a survey that suggested that if a member of Congress had a dinner party, that it would have liveried waiters and foods that most people had never tasted. But it is also the case that, which is not true, it is also that most, most members of Congress live middle class existence is probably little different than most middle managers, except for those who are, self, who are millionaires. But let me say one other thing. Americans Quickly, believe though, that right. all elites in this society now, every elite from sports to religion, everywhere else, live by a set of arrogant standards and lifestyles that are unavailable to and, the rest and of us. The, the arrogance of other elites is, it, it doesn't approach the arrogance of most congressmen I know. But I, one of my favorite anecdotes is from uh, Jim Coyne and John Fund did this book, uh, Cleaning House. And they talk about the uh, congressional members only golf tournament that they have every year. And the award ceremony in a recent one, there were about a hundred, little over a hundred congressmen participated. They had been in, in the invitation. It said, uh, "Have uh, sponsors from your district pr uh, give us uh, uh, gifts for the for the prizes for the tournament." Twenty-five hundred gifts, everything from golf bags to sweaters to crystal, were there, uh, valued conservatively at seventy-five thousand dollars. They had the award ceremony, and, and y you would maintain this is kind of honest graft. Well, well, I'm just saying it's symbolic of the arrogance right. because eventually the awards uh, program broke down, and all the congressmen rushed the stand and were fighting with each other to get these. This this happened just a couple of years ago. You know, it, it's true, Ben. There was a plantation mentality on Capitol Hill for a long time, where each individual member had his personal entourage and resources, and and made decisions as he saw, or she saw them. Mostly um, me. Uh, I think that's changed. Slowly we're getting a professionalization of the administration of the House, and there's some time lag here, and some members are getting well, caught but, in the but, old but, but a typical, rules and old ways typical, of doing business. A typical member of Congress uh, what, has about 25 to 30 staff members, is that right? Uh, the, 20 staff members in the House. Uh, the Senate varies by, uh, uh, by the size and, and, of the and state the, population. These people are, in fact, and it used to be one or two or three. I mean, you go back in American history, so, so they have and this is personal staff that, that you say... Well, let's be clear, personal yeah, right, staff, right. what do they do? They, they, well, the argument they, is that one thing they do is micromanage the, go is micromanage the government yeah. and get their nose into every little bit of... But, Ben, the reality is if you look at the deployment of staff, you'll find most of those people are doing, quote, constituent service. It's good for their re-election campaigns, but it has relatively little to do with so, policy so making. From, from, from the point of view of the, the citizen, it is anti-demosclerotic. -demo it, 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 it is providing services that, Jonathan, you say people aren't getting. Just, just the opposite is true, Ben. I, I think that what's see, happening... See what a good question it was? <laughs> <laughs> what's happening here, um, a slight gloss on what Ed said earlier, I don't think it's the arrogance so much as people correctly perceive 
that this institution is not working. I don't mean getting things done. I mean government is not solving problems. And the reason it's not solving problems is this institution is overwhelmed with interest groups and programs which it created and is besieged by and now cannot get rid of. It's like a ship sinking under right, the, 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 Let's move on. The, 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 the code word for what, what you were talking about has, has been in recent years gridlock. And everybody said gridlock is terrible. Is, is that what you're talking about, that it's, the institution is gridlocked and that's bad? Gridlock is, in fact, a myth. If you look at any objective indicators that we have, Congress is now doing more, producing more, busier than at any other time in history. The problem isn't that things don't get done, it's that what does get done fails to solve problems. In fact, tends to create more problems than it solves. Well, well it, where, I mean, conservatives could say the laws are terrible, liberals could say the laws are terrible. Where do you put yourself on that spectrum? Why are the laws, are, are they too conservative, the laws? Are they too liberal? Are they, are, are they too foolish? Are, it's, it's neither of the above. It's the fact that you're stuck with all of them forever. We're basically stuck with Congress's first try for 40 or 50 years. And you cannot make a program work in a world where you're stuck with a 1935 welfare program See, in 1994. I, I think that is the, the real gridlock. It's not in the, the bills that are in Congress right now. It's the fact that we live with everything that's been passed. The gridlock is in this huge, vast inventory of laws. Part of the, the process of Congress, the log rolling, is, you know, I'll vote for your noxious bill if you vote for my bill that you think is noxious. But beyond that, it's that you better not vote for anything I had passed in the, in the past. I, th I think that the, the uh, longer you're in Congress, the bigger the reservoir of bills that you're protect, uh, protecting. And, and the real gridlock in Congress is this huge uh, inventory, uh, Jonathan. I, I, dis I disagree with that point, although uh, Jonathan has a very good point, it seems to me. He has two very good points. The first is we are in the process because of this self-hatred, uh, which is the hatred of the institution going somewhat overboard. No, it's self -hate, no you don't mean self-hatred. Self-hatred, it's a hatred of, of the way the process has but, been But not been by the working. congressman, by, no, no, by, by their constituents. By the public, right, yeah, by yeah. The public but it's a, a hatred of the institution, of purging the institution of things that have made it work. I think we're leading towards a gridlock. We're not there. But what's happened is that uh, members of Congress have become so ultra-sensitive because of this tremendous public backlash to public opinion that they will not do anything that reaches a level of unpopularity. And that means that when you do have things that are demonstrably bad, you develop constituencies for no, them and what, we don't what, change what, them. What exactly is wrong with a Congress that listens to the public? That's I, mean, not I thought that was, that was one of the things the that, that I understood. Been, I mean, <laughs> my, my reading of that, that Constitution indicated that was one of the things they were supposed to do. You need to read a little more, a little more <laughs> deeply about it. Well, ben, you've got to get to Madison. I'm sure I do. That's uh, why I have <laughs> such experts on this show. Re yes. Return yeah. to James Madison. Right. Congress was set up as a deliberative assembly. It was to refine and enlarge public views, not simply to reflect immediate public preferences, but to come together in a face-to-face -face situation and discuss problems and try to bargain out the myriad differences in a vast society such as ours. Nowadays, it's the external world that's changed. The public is mobilized. Everyone is organized into a group, including the libertarians, and everyone is making demands on their individual members of Congress. They feel more vulnerable. The institution is open. And they give the public what they say they want, but not what they need. And in fact, Ben, we're not talking about the public here. We're talking about thousands and thousands of professionalized activists and interest groups who work Congress for a living. And in fairness to the populace, Tom is right, but he might also add that Congress exploits this process by ginning up lots of bills and programs um, in order to shake out PAC contributions from these groups and then go to work for them, creating new subcommittees, new chairmanships. Um, so it's a two-way cycle. It's, it's two sides feeding each other. But you mentioned James Madison. I mean, Madison uh, didn't view Congress as the end all of the federal government. Uh, if you wanted, there was a kind of gridlock built into the system, uh, the checks and balances. The president's supposed to veto unconstitutional legislation or legislation he doesn't like. The Supreme Court has completely abrogated their role as being a bulwark of our liberties against what Madison knew were the, uh, would be the excesses from the political branch of government. Now, Jonathan, you, 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 have, you have written about this. I mean, it, our special interests, uh, are they good or bad? I mean, they, they in fact, when you have, uh, 
you know, uh, the, uh, the National Bicycle Association or the doctors or the lawyers or anyone else. The think Tank Association think of tank, America. Think, yeah. The Think Tank Association of America. <laughs> PBS has uh, the, the public broadcasting people. Oh, they'd that. never lobby. They, they, they would never <laughs> lobby. But, but they are representing people. What's wrong with that? Well, that's like saying medicines, good or bad. And the answer is, of course, any particular medicine is good. But if you lose, if you use a hundred of them at once, you're going to get very sick. And that's what's happening. It's not that particular groups are bad or evil. A lot of them do good things. It's that when you've got thousands of them and you're creating thousands more every year and they're all descending on Washington, opening up offices and coming to Capitol Hill and demanding stuff and then defending it forever, the system begins to sink. And, and, and it, it, there's concentrated benefits, we all know this, and diffuse costs. So you have all these special interests. Now, we, explain that. Uh, well, the, a program benefit. could benefit a special interest to the tune of $100 million. To the average American, that's a half a penny. So the special interest is going to come to Washington and lobby very hard and do everything in their power to get the $100 million. You or I are not going to go to, to Congress to save, save our half a penny. And that so process <laughs> leads inexorably. <laughs> is it? Okay, <laughs> 50 cents. Ah, ah gotcha, right. right. Leads inexorably. Math was to, never to, a strong to, point. To, uh, to more government growth. But that, that doesn't match with the composition of the federal budget. Uh, special interests are scapegoats. Uh, the reality is that most of the budget goes to send checks to individual citizens who don't think of themselves as, included, as part though. of a a special interest and the idea that we have these concentrated benefits and diffuse costs which is driving the deficit just doesn't square with the reality of what the budget is. The now. irony here though to get back to a point that Jonathan made right at the beginning of the show is who has tended to be more resistant to the importunings of the whole range of interests to try and pull something together that keeps them at a little bit of a distance while still using them as grease to get something through. It tends to be the old Pauls. Getting a majority out of 435 very disparate, individually, independently empowered individuals is extremely difficult to do. And we had a system that tended to keep them at a little bit more of a distance. The reforms that have opened up this process and reforms that are now pushed out of a hatred for the individual members and a zeal to remove corruption actually open up the process to interests even more to a much wider range and make members more vulnerable to them and lead to a much bigger problem than what we have had. It's That's like, the danger. I mean, it's, it's like and, putting and, a honeypot in front of an anthill. And, and Norm, I guess now's the time to say that the politician on Capitol Hill who did the single most important thing about curtailing this problem, the tax reform bill of 1986, which struck away truckloads of special interest yeah. loopholes, that man was Dan Rostenkowski and we're about to boot him out and everything that he stands for, not just what he is being accused of in his indictment, but everything that he stands for as a politician is under uh, extreme attack, uh, when in fact many of the qualities that he has had are virtues in this process we just don't recognize. Ed, Ed, Ed Crane, if there is gridlock and your general position is that more federal legislation just in general, because it regulates, it take, I've read your recent speech, I mean it takes away our freedom you maintain, uh, you must be pro-gridlock. Pro yeah, right? I don't think the Congress should be this sort of uh, uh, giant bag of, of goodies that the, every, all the congressional districts come in and fight for their share. I don't think that's what the founders had in mind. I, I am against the gridlock that, it, that exists in the form of all these thousands of laws, this inventory of laws, many of which are detrimental, unless we think we have an omnipotent Congress and then we have nothing but terrific are, are, people. Are you and Jonathan... Se sort of on the same <coughs> side of this argument. Am I, am I getting it right? Only occasionally. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Tom I mean, and Norm are on the same side, but I'm trying Ed to wants, think. Ed wants to shrink government. I don't care about the size of it. I want to make it more flexible so that it can function to solve problems. But to do that, you've got to be able to unload lots of old stuff that's choking it. And to do that, okay. you have to get around the wall right, of interest. Let, let, go ahead, yes, Tom, and then right, I want to no, move that on. That just to means right. strengthening leadership. The problems are hypersensitivity to outside interests, hyper-individualism. We need to strengthen the center, a little less focus on appearances, a little more on, on outcomes. That means right. giving the leaders some resources to get okay, the job let, done. Let, let us use that as, as a way to segue into this last part of, of this program, which is what we ought to do about it. What are the solutions? 
I know, Mr. Crane, I know of one of yours, which you are permitted to mention briefly, which is term limits, but what else, mention that. Well, they're, they're, let's, let's well you know, you can, so, uh, the, the, the usual things get rid of the franking privilege and, and other, uh, other things that give uh, incumbents such an advantage, but I think one very effective reform would be a constitutional amendment to limit uh, spending for Congress. And that would sort of allow them to fight on the merits of things rather than this log rolling process of everybody voting for everybody else's bill. And the second thing I think that's critical is congressional term limitation. Eighty percent of Americans favor term limits. Congress uh, hates the idea. But I think we need a citizen legislature. I think that's what the founders had in mind, a representative legislature that's in touch with the people and not the, not the professional politicians we have now. So six years in the House, 12 years in the Senate, that's the majority of the 15 states that have passed, uh, have, that have limited the terms of their delegations have, have those uh, constraints. I think that would get a different kind of people seeking office. What are, what are your favorite solutions? I mean, we, 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 we are agreed that there's a problem out there in Congress land. I mean, there, there's okay. no question right. that there are problems. I think that uh, well-meaning as uh, Ed is and as his suggestions are, they would lead to exactly the opposite result. And, and the 80 percent of the American people who approve of term limits. Yeah, 80 percent of Americans approved of term limits for a president, which I think has been a disaster. The two-term limit has been bad. Uh, limits everywhere are bad. In California, they now have term limits. Are we getting citizen legislators coming? Yes. We're getting people squabbling over how they move to the next step on the ladder. You're getting hyper-ambitious people, not people who are selfless and noble. And frankly, because of this climate of distrust and hatred, where the average person in public life is viewed as a leper in a colony, we're not getting good people coming to public life at all. So that's think, no solution uh, to me. Uh, you, you think the public is electing some lepers and nutcases. Would you, would you care to char I, I characterize or name any of those people? What, what is I mean, happening here is, I, you know, I look at most of the younger people coming into state legislatures or the junior people and junior people coming into Congress. And they don't have qualities of leadership that I've seen in the past. They are more sensitive to every little burp in public opinion than one can imagine. Are they they are not willing to cast tough votes unless they think those votes will aid them politically. I, 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 they and they're looking at the next step up the ladder. They are very ambitious. So uh, a ambition in Washington? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm shocked. I'm shocked. People, people who want term limits. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. People who want term limits, though, Ben, yeah. want to squeeze ambition out of the process. They want noble citizen legislators who aren't personally ambitious. That's not going to so happen. And you wanted to say something about his term limit. I saw you had a... Uh, well, he mentioned California. There are 27 freshmen in the assembly in California, 14 Democrats, 13 Republicans. All but one of them is really a citizen legislator because term limits kicked in uh, last, the last election. And that has worked very well. Norm, how about saying the reforms of the 70s were a mistake, Congress worked better when there were about six people on Capitol Hill you needed to see to get things done, and start unrolling some of that stuff. Radically reduce the number of committees, the number of access points for lobby, strengthen the chairmanships, the leadership, in effect go back to an institution that is less accessible to, to lobby. Could, could I ask you each uh, briefly to try to summarize for us what you think you all agree upon and what you disagree upon? Well, and I think, why don't you I think start? Norman did think con Congress is, uh, is perfect in its entirety, or at least it's, it's a wonderful institution. I, I think that there's, a, there's agreement that the public perception of Congress is very bad. Uh, I think there's strong disagreement in terms of what the, what the goals of reform should be. Okay. Well, I think we can go a bit further. I, I sense agreement here that this is an institution which is really quite sick and that well-meaning reforms, if we're not careful, are just going to make it worse, which is exactly what I fear right now. I think, as Ed says, we don't agree about which way the reforms ought to go, but we do have a general sense that too much access, too much openness combined with pursuing members of Congress for every little peccadillo is counterproductive. That's making it worse. I think we agree that most of Congress's problems result from changes in the broader political and social uh, environment, including the mobilization of interest groups outside, and that some of the most popular reforms uh, might do more harm than good. Uh, I, that's uh, basically right. Uh, I think at least three of us would agree that uh, Congress is not perfect, and indeed we have a list of reforms in three separate volumes uh, that are not designed for a perfect institution. But three of us, I think, would agree that the constitutional design is what you want, and you don't want to damage that fundamental constitutional design. Indeed, you want to return 
to some of the virtues that were there that we've gotten away from. And the danger is, as John suggested, that reforms that are well-meaning will move us further from, uh, from that particular goal and not toward it. Thank you, Norman Ornstein, Tom Mann, Jonathan Rauch, Ed Crane, and thank you. Uh, as you know, this is a new program, and we have appreciated hearing from you very much. Please send us your comments to the address on the screen. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Watton. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.